So today I'm going to try to do justice to Mr. James Perloff's book, Tornado in a Junkyard. Uh, if you look at the, um, the, this, this, this phrase here, this sentence, order does not spontaneously form from disorder. A tornado passing through a junkyard would never assemble a 747. This book is actually a rebuttal of Darwinism. Darwin actually said that his work was a slow and silent attack on the Bible. Notice the, 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 the symbol that he's making with his hands. It's the devil symbol. It's a symbol of the illuminated ones. Tomorrow at my program called The Politics That Pollute Paradise, I'm going to explain to you how evil people have grabbed all the world's resources. For instance, when the Federal Reserve Bank prints money for, for, for the United States of America, we the people owe them every dollar back plus interest. And what, some of the, what, what they've done with that money is that they use it to um, fund the media. They've purchased the media. And there's something called the 10 precepts I'm going to explain very briefly tomorrow. And everything that they get their hands on, they use it specifically to promote a philosophy that's called the Ten Precepts. Now, the Ten Precepts are the polar opposite of the Ten Commandments. And Mr. Darwin, is he's thrown up the sign. He's a Ten Precepts guy, so they promote his lies through the media. In 1983, a, uh, an astrologer Actually, um, Fred Hoyle, he's the one that actually invented this, this um, sentence, that we're, this, this concept that we're talking about here. A junkyard contains all the bits and pieces of a Boeing 747. However, how many tornadoes do you think it would take to pass through that junkyard to assemble a plane? Couldn't happen, could it? And we're going to talk about that today. Why, why we know that devolution, I mean evolution, is not true. The whole argument about creation versus evolution hinges on gen whether or not Genesis 1-1 and John 1-1 through 3 are true. The issue is, is God the creator with a capital C, meaning that God created me, I have a responsibility towards him, or am I, am I my own God? That's really the issue. Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. You know the Bible talks about the Holy Sp the Spirit hovering over the waters. So we, we see God the Father and we see God the Holy Spirit at work. And then in John 1, 1 through 3, it tells us that in the beginning was the Word. Jesus is the living Word. He's the living expression of God's, of, of God's um, mentality. He's the living expression of God's um, emphasis, of God's will upon the earth. So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made. So we, we see the, the Trinity at work in Genesis 1 and John 1, 1 through 3. Well, what did God do? You know, the, um, Western, in Western civilization, people believed that God is a rational creator. And we believe that we're made in God's image. So from a Western perspective, Western civilization is nothing more than Christian civilization. It's how Christianity, we used to study in school something called Western civilization. Right. And it literally was nothing more than how Christianity civilized the Western world. The, world, the word gentleman did not come into anybody's vocabulary until people witnessed um, the Christian behavior in men. So anyway... People in a Western tradition who believe that God, we are made in God's image, God is a rational creator, we delved into scientific achievement, not to thumb our nose at God, not to say that we're better than God, not to say that God doesn't exist. Westerners delved into scientific achievement from the perspective of, wow, God made a really, really cool world. We're made in his image. Let's study and cut a few things open and examine some things and see what God did. We realize that God is the master scientist. And he gave us all the physical um, rules that order our universe. We also realize that he's the great... 
We also realize that he's the great moral order of the universe, and that's what his Ten Commandments are all about. The ten, you can break the Ten Commandments up into three parts. Commandments one through four it orders our relationship with God. Commandment number five orders our relationship with our family. Commandment six through ten orders our relationship with the rest of society. Although six through ten applies to the family as well. Because where did the first murder occur? In a family. I don't know. I've heard, but I'm not really sure it's true. Because I haven't experienced it in my own family. That family can get on your last nerve. <laughs> anyway, there are four areas of science that refute evolution. We have them uh, termed as the acronym, if I can get them in order, MIST, M-I-S-T. And what MIST stands for is one, mutations. The I stands for irreducible complexity. The S stands for the significance of cellular complexity. And the T stands for transitional. There's a lack of transitional forms in the species. And I'm going to unpack these four points for you today. So we have MIST, if you want to think about it that way. Mutations, irreducible complexity. And irreducible complexity is really related to a concept called whole system functionality. Like you can't, if you only have part of an eye, it's not going to work. The entire system has to be there for your eye to work. So how could the eye have evolved when half an eye won't work? You need the whole system to, to come into place all at once. And we're going to explain, not just from the eye, but from some other um, bodily functions, uh, why that's true. And then we're going to talk about the significance of cellular complexity. Um, Darwin's theories hinge, on, hinge on, the, on the mistaken belief at his time that a cell was a very simple organism. There wasn't a lot going on within that organism. And that's how life could begin in a warm pond with an expulsion of gas. The definition of fart is a minor explosion between the legs. <laughs> Darwinism. <laughs> Go look it up in a dictionary. I did when I was in fourth grade, and I used to tell that to people in the classroom, and I spent some time in the corner because of that definition. Anyway, uh, lack of transitional forms of species. If evolution is true, we should see some fossil record of like, Something that's sort of a cross between a giraffe and an elephant. What's, where are the transitional species? Let's unpack these. The first area of science that refutes evolution is mutations. Chapter 3 in Tornado in a Junkyard explains why genetic mutations can't create higher life forms. The created kinds of species are genetically distinct from each other, making evolution between them impossible. Dr. Lou Spetner shows that random mutations actually destroy genetic information, doesn't improve it. <clears throat> and chance mutations are to the genetic code what a typo is to a sentence or to a word. It messes it up. It makes it not a word. In humans, mut mut mutations cause genetic diseases like sickle cell anemia. I'm a sickle cell anemia carrier. Uh, my son is a carrier. I have other children that are not. Uh, cystic fibrosis, hemophilia, Down syndrome, and there's thousands of other genetic diseases. Lou Spetner shows that even the rare beneficial, there, in rare cases, there are benefits from these mutations, such as the bacterial resistance to antibiotics. But actually, there's still a functional loss that occurs in another part of the body. Right? Now, the second area that refutes evolution is something we call irreducible complexity, something that Mr. James Perloff calls irreducible complexity. This means that bodily functions in both humans and animals require whole system functionality. And, but for instance, blood clotting requires more than a dozen sequential steps. And if any step is out of sequence, you bleed to death. So how could, this, how could by chance blood clotting occur if every time the chance random uh, mutation got it wrong, the subject died? 
So whole system functionality means you can't reduce any of the elements or the processes without fatal consequences. So you couldn't have these intermediate steps. In the beginning was God, God said let there be light, and then God created whole system functionality. He created entire animals. Hey, uh, I, I'm, uh, I, like, I, I do a lot of um, uh, training on how humans should get along and behave with each other. So if you look at C, you'll see there's this guy down there named Abraham Maslow. And his needs hierarchy comes into play here, I think. And what Abraham Maslow's needs hierarchy states is that if you're cold and naked in a storm, you're not thinking about reading a book. You're not thinking about a higher level function. You're thinking about your base needs. So what you do is you go find a cave and you get warm. And once you're in the cave, you realize, okay, I'm not freezing to death. I need to eat. You don't think about eating when you're freezing to death. So the, the concept of, um, of, of whole system functionality comes into play, I believe, in human psychology as well. The body healing itself involves a complex process that had to be developed in a whole holistic creative act. The third area that refutes evolution is this whole thing about the significance of cells. Like I said in the beginning, Darwin believed that a cell was a very simple organism. And because he thought it was so simple, he thought it would be easy for it to develop in a warm pond of water by a cosmic expulsion of gas. Cellular science refutes Darwin's theory because we now know that cells are not simple, that they require thousands of different proteins, each composed of hundreds of amino acids arranged in precise order. Otherwise, the cell can't function. The third area is what we call, uh, uh, I'm going I'm to talk about cellular uh, significance um, for a bit here. I think I have four slides on it. Now, this third area that, of uh, cellular significance that refutes evolution, we, we have to look at also something called prebiotic molecules. They came together by chance. If they came together by chance and formed the first living cell, for that to have happened would be a statistical improbability. And that's why we talk about a tornado in a junkyard. So Darwin postulated that simple life somehow began in a warm pond. We now know it's not true. Now, those cells are small. They require a complex series of elements. One is a genetic code. Two are transitional devices. And three, they, and all these, all these transitional um, devices, when, what we mean by um, translation devices is that there's information being carried from the cell to other parts of the body. Other parts, cells in other parts of the body are receiving that information. And so for these translational uh, activities to occur, other things have to happen in precise order. All the events have to happen in precise order. So all the required chance random ordering for evolution to be true is mathematically impossible. Am I going too fast? Evolution can't answer the questions related to transitional value, meaning what good is half an eye? Perloff's explanation of irreducible complexity explains why half an organ won't win any battles for survival of the fittest. The classification system, which we call taxonomy, taxonomy is the science of classifying animals, or and, and, uh, It shows that there's differences in species and there are no intermediate species. Like I said, we don't see any half skunk and half lion roaming around. We don't see a skunk and a half rat. We don't see a half rat, half squirrel. We see that bats fly, but genetically they're rodents. They don't have feathers. I like what Perloff says here. It would be like trying to divide a rainbow into distinct colors. Exactly where does orange end and red begin? But animals are easily classified because there are such obvious differences. Eating grass and I'm gonna become a meat-eating predator. 
So there's no evidence for these transitional forms. Not in the living world and not in the world that you see under a microscope, the bacteria world. You don't see it among fish, you don't see it among amphibians, you don't see it among reptiles and mammals. Actually, if you look at Darwin's uh, theory of evolution, I realized this when I was like in sixth grade, that if you read the Bible and God tells you, I created this first and then this next and then this next, evolution actually follows that, that pattern. Evolution says, well, there must have been a fish, and the fish developed somehow developed feet, and it walked on the, on the um, land, and then somehow it, be, it had fins look like a kind of like a wing, so somehow it, it, it evolved to fly. And if you look at God's order of creation in Genesis, I think Darwin kind of followed that and came up with his theory. Then he denied that he got the theory, the concept from the Bible. Anyway, there are thousands of distinct species, but there's, there are no intermediate species. Evolutionists try to say the missing intermediates, uh, the missing intermediate species are all extinct and that's why we don't see them. But if they were extinct, where's the fossil record? You know why they tell us they're extinct? You know why they tell us these things are hundreds of millions of years old? Because they don't exist. It's like people who tell us there are huge swashes of the ocean where there are no fish. I say they're only telling you that because you can't go out to the ocean and prove them wrong. <laughs> Think about one of the lies that we're told about, our, about God's creative goodness. The most populous places in the world are the wealthiest places in the world. London, Tokyo, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, Reykjavik, Iceland, or Greenland is it? Um, Stuttgart, Germany, Frankfurt, Germany, New York City. The most populous places on earth are where we have the most resources, where we have the most stores, we have the most shopping uh, facilities, we have the most restaurants. People, I was, uh, I was getting coffee one morning, I'm standing in line, there were some college kids sitting at a table and they were haggling over a paper or some project they had to write. And there was something, I heard them talking about the baby seals going extinct. So I got my coffee, I said, hey, what's going on with the baby seals? And they said, oh, the Inuit Indians, they're killing the baby seals and the baby seals are dying off. I said, wow. I mean, when's that going to occur? Any day now. How long have they been killing the baby seals? Forever. I mean, 10 years? No, no, thousands, millions of years. 10,000 years? No, no, way longer than that. 25? No, no, no way. Millions of years? Yes, even longer. And I said, and we haven't run out of baby seals yet. <laughs> but you're going to writing a paper that all the baby seal population is going to die tomorrow. <laughs> and they said, well, what are you talking about? I said, well, I'm a mama seal. I'm breastfeeding my pup. Some guy comes along and kills my pup. My milk dries up. I go back into gestation. I get pregnant. Maybe I have two pups. They're like, is that what's been happening? Yes. Yeah. That's what's been happening. Uh, I don't think my professor's gonna like saying that. I said, but if somebody doesn't stand up and set your professor straight and, and you're not willing to take that D, our world's in big trouble. You know, I was driving down the road here to camp and I noticed there's grass growing up in part of the road on the way to camp here. Anybody notice that on, the, on, on uh, Old Ashburnham Road, right? You see the grass in the middle of the road? Well, they're trying to tell us that uh, nature needs our help and that five minutes from now, the whole world is going to turn brown, and it'll never turn green again. I'm like, okay, let's just set our watch. <laughs> I got a timer. Let's time it and see. If you don't fight the seed that God tells us about in Genesis, if you don't go out to your garage and spray the corners of your garage and fight the seed, the multiplication factor that God explains in Genesis, if you don't spray the cracks in your sidewalk from where the two pieces of cement uh, come together, if you don't mow your lawn, God's seed will grow up and it will break apart all man-made things. When people are talking about uh, evolution and the world's going to come to an end and nature needs your help, they're making a, that's a blasphemy against the creative goodness of God. They are slandering God's character and he's going to punish our society for doing so. 
Anyway, the reason for, their, for the non-existence of, these, uh, of, of the fossil evidence that there are these transitional um, uh, species is because they never existed in the first place. Evolutionists say fossils are extinct creatures and their so-called evidence for these transitional uh, stages exists somewhere, but we can't find them. You know what they do? They make them up. I'm going to show you this, though. While fossils show variations within types, they, don't, they do not validate these, these transitions between major animal groups, which would be required to validate Darwin's theory of macroevolution. Now, we do believe, some people believe in microevolution, where we have the first dog. All the breeds of dogs may have come from that dog. Um, I um, used to write business plans as a sideline, and so I was at a, a friend's 40th birthday party, and um, another kid that we grew up with, he was a horse trainer. And I had noticed in the paper that he won a horse race at Saratoga Springs. And I mean, this kid grew up with me, I know he's not a rich guy, Where, how can you afford horses? He goes, I only have one horse, and um, I, it's just my hobby. And I said, but you won a race at Saratoga and you only have one horse? He goes, yeah, it took me like five years, but I finally won one. Anyway, so I'm like, tell me about your horse business. But to make a long story short, I said to him, what could you do if you had, you know, $800,000 or a million dollars of investment? I used to write, I have a friend, another friend, he, was in a, he ran an accounting firm. And after tax season, people would be looking to take some of their money and put it into local businesses. In our neck of the woods, we have a business called Bruger Bagels, and there's several Bruger Bagel establishments floating around, and one of my friends worked on the Bruegel Bagel business plan. So, you know, we're, we're, we got this idea that, you know, the economy was bad, let's try to get local businesses off the ground and make a long story short. We, I, I, I spent some time with him, I, and, I, and I wrote a, a plan for him to, uh, to buy five, six, seven horses, and, um, and we started a business called... I forget what it, what it was called, but anyway, um, and, and uh, uh, like 25 people invested money in it, and the the point is what I'm really trying to get to, and how it relates to this is that when breeds are young and new, you can make the mother, you can make the brother and the sister. After about the fifth to the seventh, sometimes even the tenth generation, the the gene pool gets watered down, it gets diluted, it, and you can't do that anymore. I learned that by uh, working with these horse breeders. Now, for example, while bands of invertebrate fossils exist, fossils illustrating their alleged evolution from, from simple ancestors are missing. We can't find a fossil record that shows, oh, there was this type of cell, and it developed into these two types of cells, and then it developed into a polywog, and then it developed into, we don't find fossils. We can't find the fossil record of that. We can find the polywog, we can find the frog. Polywog's a baby frog. It wasn't something else before it was the baby frog. So the studies of fossils have a very storied and, what can I say, nefarious history. People are so desperate to prove evolution, they're making stuff up. So in 1912, somebody announced that he found Piltdown Man. Piltdown Man proved to be a fake. It actually was the jawbone of an orangutan placed in a grave with a part of a human skull and it was actually stained with shellac or something to make it look old. And, and whoever did this filed down the teeth. And other scientists came and examined this thing and said, I don't know, this doesn't look real. So, you know, what, what commandment did that hoax violate. Commandment number nine, lying. You see, if you're a Ten Commandments person, if you have a Ten Commandments value system, you're not going to do this sort of stuff. But if you have a Ten Precepts value system, you will actually write books to promote the lie. Because the Ten Precepts are the exact opposite of the Ten Commandments. The Precept says, if I can lie to further my cause, hallelujah, and shame on you. Evolutionists say that we have, they used to say that we have 180 useless organs in our body. They were left there from some uh, former evolutionary transition. Well, we now know that the thyroid gland is very important. You know, in the old, in the old days, they're like, well, why, why do you need the thyroid gland? And uh, 
current science has proven all these concepts to be false. They used to say, the evolutionists used to say, well, we evolved out of creatures that lived in the sea, and they postulated that our blood must contain 50% uh, salt. Our, our, our blood had to have a 50% salt content, content. It had to be, because we came out of the sea, and the sea is salty. Well, that's been proven wrong. The idea that we have the uh, same uh, percentage of, uh, of salt in our blood that one finds in an ocean is just not true. The concept was floated. It was paid for by 10 precept um, business owners who own publishing companies uh, to support the idea that we evolved from the sea. The other thing that they used to say is that babies had tails. Before we could clearly see fetuses, they said, oh, yeah, yeah, babies had tails. And the, guys that, the guy that floated that, he just drew pictures. This is what a baby looks like in the womb. You just extended your little behind and put a little tail on the end. And people published that in books and taught it in college campuses. Now, the difference between micro and macro evolution, it doesn't, it's not a gap in logic. It's a dog, and there may be other dogs coming from it. There's a horse, and there may be other breeds of horses coming for, from it. Anyway. Now, if evolution is not true, it's because the Bible is true. There's, what put me on to this whole thing about sustainability, I was teaching a Bible, I was teaching Genesis to, uh, to some college students, and we read in the beginning, and God says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And they said, whoa, 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 Mr. Wallace, go back. The Bible has to say only be fruitful to a point because of sustainability. How can the world be sustained? So I explained to them about the seed and all that, and about you know how the most populous places on the earth are where we actually have the most medical care. The worst places to live on earth are the places where we have the least population. But the Bible notes that on the eighth day, you should get circumcised. Why on the eighth day? Well, science has proven that that's the safest day to do it. When a baby is born, there's no bacteria in their intestines for the first few days. And on that eighth day, there's more there than probably any other time in that kid's life. By the seventh day, the bacteria multiply and they produce vitamin K. Without vitamin K, the prothrombin protein, which is produced by the liver using vitamin K, the blood will not clot properly, and the possibility of severe bleeding as well as an infection would make circumcision extremely dangerous, especially if you're out in the wilderness doing it. So the Bible reveals that our blood also is the essence of life. And the Bible says in Leviticus 17:11 that the blood is the essence of life, testing to the uh, Bible scientific accuracy. We see whole system functionality in the Bible. Now, here's a Boeing plant. I'm going to give the tornado. Um, uh, I'm going to try to increase the tornado's odds here. This is a Boeing plant on your left, and on the right is a. Uh, a Rolls-Royce aircraft engine that is made in these, uh, well, the, the engine's not made there, but they put the engine in the, bo in the plane, in the Boeing plant. Now, I'm going to give the tornado, I'm going to try to increase the tornado's odds. We're not just going to say, can the tornado go through a junkyard and create that plane? Let's see if it can even go through a factory and assemble anything. Do you think that that's a possibility? A tornado is going to go through the factory, and it's actually going to pick that engine up. It's going to put it in a fuselage. It's going to bolt everything down. And after the tornado has passed through, you get in the cockpit, start up the plane, and the engine starts. Oh, and by the way, the tornado has to put the seat in the plane, bolt the seat down, put the windshield in place. That's how we're created. We have lenses in our eyes. So we all know this, right? I want, to, I want to encourage us with something, though. The Bible's view of creation is unique. All other societies who are, who, who are not Christian nations, they tend to have a different view about creation. Now, Christians, Jews, uh, Muslims do believe in the Genesis record. If you read the Quran, everything is sort of reversed. Abraham does not take Isaac up the, the, the hill, the mountain to sacrifice him, he takes Ishmael. So, but in many, many societies, they believe that, and, and what you're going to see is that, that, that these kind of concepts are still floating around, and they're actually prevalent in our movies, and they're prevalent in our culture. Because 
our, our culture now is being blended with people who have who come from a different tradition other than the Bible believing tradition. Ancient Mesopotamians believed that the universe was was a, a vast course corpse of a fallen deity. That's the New Age movement. The Earth is God. The Earth is actually a deity, and we worship trees. If you uh, sometimes in my programs, I think you've seen this slide when I teach the Ten Commandments, I show you the little sharp eye uh, puppy, the cute little puppy, and I show you the little wrinkly baby sitting next to it. Well, if you kill that baby, it's called an abortion right. You touch that puppy, and the earth-hugging people will come to your house with TV cameras and persecute you as an abuser. There, that, this concept is in our society. The Greeks viewed matter as something that always existed. From, uh, from this, modern scientists say, uh, they try to call it the Big Bang. They said there was always something that existed and there was this Big Bang. Well, what made the Big Bang? Well, what always existed? Well, what was it that existed? We know in the beginning God said, let there be light. <laughs> That's the Big Bang. Caused matter to come into existence. Only the Bible describes the material universe as the intentional, productive creative act performed by a loving God who, who created the perfect existence for us here on the planet and then he puts us on the planet. So science is in, not the science of evolution is in, I got 20 more minutes, is in direct opposition to, to, um, to uh, what the Bible says. A tale of two endings. Why two endings? Because what you believe about how life begins is probably going to determine how your life ends. Right. Meaning, how, what you believe about the beginning of our existence is probably going to determine what happens to you when you stand before God to give an account. That's good. If you believe that life started from an impersonal Big Bang, then life has no meaning. Life can be dog-eat-dog, dog, pull yourself to the top of the heap, it doesn't matter. I love the quote that we heard from Mr. Kalish yesterday. One death is a tragedy. A million, it's just a, it's just a statistic. That's where evolution leads you. If, if we all evolve from chance, then there's no purpose to life. It doesn't matter if I take a sledgehammer and bash your head in. But if I believe in the beginning there was God, and God loves me and he loves you, I believe that life is in the blood. I have blood, you have blood. When we cut a person over, I don't, uh, open, I, or you cut your finger, there's, no, no, there's nothing called Jewish blood versus, you know, Negro blood or black blood or, you know, African American blood or, 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 or Hibernian blood or... It's blood. As a matter of fact, we can take the same type of blood from who's that, if we could take a type we could take type A blood from any ethnicity in the planet and put it into another ethnicity and it'll save your life. Right. So there's there's this common denominator to life. His name is God. If you believe that in the beginning there was slime, and we all somehow uh, oozed from the primordial you know, book, or we somehow to, we somehow crawled out of the primordial ooze, then you believe that life is impersonal and we're really, people are merely just another branch of the ooze. We're just another branch of animal. There's no hope beyond the grave. If, however, you believe in the beginning there was a loving God who intentionally created the universe, he designed Earth as our unique home that is uniquely suitable for our existence. Then, you're, we call that a biblical perspective. You are enjoying, you are walking in, you are participating in a biblical perspective of life. Psalm 8, 3, 3 says this, that God crowned uh, people God made man as the crowning achievement of his creation. And he told us that we can rule over creation. Well, within this whole concept of creation, I'm going to give you some, some popular theories as to perhaps how God created the world. 
One day is called the day-age theory. That God's creative activity took place in literal 24-hour periods. There was night, there was day, then the next day. God created this, he saw that it was good, there was night, there was day, there was the next day. I'm a 24-day age person. Um, and the... Um, and then what, what, if you look in the Hebrew, there's the word yom. It means day, a, period, a specific period of time. And in the Bible, it literally says there was night, there was the, there was day, and you know that was day one. Then there is the gap theory. I also believe in the gap theory. And look at this says according to E.W. The seven days of creation described in Genesis one one uh, through two or Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3, were, was ruined by Satan's fall to earth. Um, I was teaching at a Bible camp somewhere years ago, and there was another guy there from some creation institute, and he explained this gap theory. And uh, he said that there are a lot of people who believe that, um, that when God hurled Satan out of heaven, you know, you have the, the, the I wills of Satan. Satan says, I will be God. I'll sit on his throne. I will do this. I will do that. And he convinces a third of the angels to join him. You can read about this in Isaiah chapter 14. You also can read about it in Ezekiel. And so there's a war in heaven. And so God kicks Satan out of heaven. And that's why uh, and he hurls him down to earth. And so Ephesians 2.2 2 literally calls Satan the small G-O-D of this world. Well, Many scientists believe that the um, dinosaurs disappeared on Earth by an eight mile wide meteorite striking what we now know as the Gulf of Mexico. And it sent a huge fiery dust cloud into the air. And it choked the dinosaurs in a very short period of time, a matter of days. And that's why we have fossils of dinosaurs eating each other. We have fossils of dinosaurs mating. We have fossils of, um, of dinosaurs, uh, you know, um, licking their young and so, or and sheltering their young, like something was coming and the mother is trying to protect the children. Well, we believe that, that I mean, if, you're, if, you're, if you want to ascribe to the gap theory, you believe that what we're living on is a recreated planet Earth from that event. Now, for me, I believe that in both events of creation, God literally created the world in, in seven days exactly as the Bible says. To me, the gap theory does not attack the theory of creation. Then there is the indefinite age theory. That evolution was the process God used when creating. I don't believe that one, but... If you're on a college campus and you want to bridge some gaps to your teachers, I mean, I was I became a Christian when I was in the military, so I went to college after I was in the military, and some of my professors, I kind of backed them into this corner. Well, I, well, where, where did the Big Bang come from? Well, how do you know then that under this concept called the indefinite, the indefinite age theory, that you know the, the, the God was the Big Bang, and let's say over all these man's years, the other types of creatures evolved? Could that possibly happen? Every now and then I'd get a professor to say, well, I never thought about it that way, but maybe. I'm going to conclude today by showing you why I'm giving you these theories, thank you, and why I'm trying to get you to understand how you apply the theory to, to prove creation. You kind of have to meet people where they are. There's the revelatory day theory, meaning that over a period of seven days, Moses wrote down what God told him about creation. I don't believe that one. Uh, but some Jewish people, that kind of bridges the gap and gets them thinking about, hey, God did it. Why, where did Moses get the information? He got it from God. God created it. The revelatory device theory, meaning that Moses simply used the term day to organize material for us to understand creation. I use that one to go back. If someone wants to go to that corner, I still go back and say, well, God's given Moses the concept of the day. God invented the day. All right, so there, there's a seven-day theory. God created in six days. In six consecutive 24-hour days, an unknowable period of time ago, and we kind of can kind of backtrack and say maybe you know, us young earth theologians, we believe the world might be about 6,000 years old, at least the world that we're living on, the existence that we know. We do know that there were dinosaurs and other things here. What happened to them? Well, to me, the gap theory is, makes a lot of sense and explains that. 
um, and, uh, and, he, and he rested on the Sabbath. Now, the, real, the, the important thing is that you try to get people to understand that it was God who did it. And as long as you can get them there, there's hope for them because they're going to stand before God one day and our role is to try to get them to a position where they believe God, understand that God is for them. He's a loving God. He died on the cross for their sins. So that when they do stand before him, they are, they are, they're, they're not going to uh, be challenged with going to hell. The earth is God's um, theater of attention. People call me up and say, oh, there's this going on in the stars and the heavenlies. And the... I said, well, if it is, it's a demon. If, God, if, if aliens are going to come and conquer the earth, the Lord would have told us in Revelation. There's no aliens in Revelation. Uh, all right, so I, here's what I'm trying to get to. Man is made in God's image. We are in his likeness. God's image is expressed as an hour because the Trinity created. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, we explain that from uh, John 1, uh, 1 through 5. You can also read about it in Luke 3.22. Now, what is our purpose? Why did God create us? He created us to rule over. All the creatures that move along the ground, the fish, the birds, the livestock, we're here because God blessed us, and he said, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth. You know where the ten precepts people originated? At the Tower of Babel, where Nimrod said, my grandmother, Mrs. Noah, she was an antediluvian. She survived the flood because she's a half fish, half God woman. We're not going to go disperse ourselves throughout the world the way God said. We don't have to be afraid of him. I'm going to build a tower so high that God is, he'll never drown us again. Just stick with me. Josephus says that even then, Nimrod could not dissuade people from believing in God. So he took you to the tower and threw you off. <laughs> if you didn't go along with his plan. But God came down and he broke it up. Because he did not want ultimate earthly power consolidated into the hands of a few ruthless sinners who want to pack people together and control. Control is a euphemism for kill, hurt. All right, so God says, I'm giving you every plant and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. How many seeds are in a grape? A tomato, a watermelon, an apple, each one of which will create another tomato or, veg or fruit or vegetable that has all these other plants hanging off it that have multiple, 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 multiple seeds. God made a completely sustainable planet. The only reason they're lying to us about it is so they can control you. Because if the world is going to end five minutes from now, everything's going to turn brown and we, we, we won't be able to eat. Then you will give me totalitarian control to save you. And trust me, when I get that control, you're not going to eat. <laughs> that's the first thing that's going to happen. You won't be eating. <laughs> so we should note and teach children in Sunday schools that God made us a, a sustainable planet. It's completely replenishable. He's a good God. And, and, you know, coal and oil are not some outer-worldly substance from which we need protection. From which we need protection. Coal and oil is... We're, I'm, I'm blowing carbon in the air. They're saying carbon pollution, man-made carbon pollution. That's code for kill the people that are blowing carbon into the air. If I don't blow carbon in the air and if the cows don't flatulate it, there's a little scientific thing called photosynthesis, which makes things turn green. That cannot occur. So they're absolutely lying to us about these things. And it's all code for we're going to kill humans. Now, here's... Here's how you defend your faith. Know what the Bible says. Stop relying upon other people to give it to you. Read it for yourself. Amen. The Bible says that every man's a liar. I'm a liar. So you can't trust what I say all the time. Check it out with the Bible yourself. Uh, know where and why what the enemy says is contrary to what the Bible teaches. Know that all discussions on creation versus evolution are evangelical opportunities. That's why I don't care how my professors want to get to God, to the concept of God. I'll work with them wherever they start with. I'll go day age. I'll go revelatory theory. I don't care. But, uh, but what, the, what I'm trying to do is, I, I'm not going to say it this way, but I'm trying, not trying to back them into a corner, but I am. I'm trying to bring them to the logical extent of the conclusion of their own ideas so they can see that God did it. I use this Tarzan picture because he's as like close to an 
ape man, which we don't believe in, that we have in our uh, human record, <laughs> even though it's in mythology. No, that the road, you have to know the Romans road to salvation. And um, it's right here for you. Jot down these scriptures and go read them for yourself. Romans 3.23. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everybody's a sinner. One, one out of one person in the world, I see you trying to write here. I got your way. One out of one person in the world sins. One out of one person in the world um, is, is destined to hell. The Bible says in John 3, 17 and 18, if you haven't believed, you're already condemned. I was born into sin. In, in Psalm 51, it says, in iniquity I was conceived. My mom's a sinner. My dad's a sinner. I got sin, sinful DNA. And when I became of the age of accountability, I became a, well, a sinner by commission. I, be, I started really sinning when I was two, but I wasn't accountable for it. I teach a book called Lord of the Flies in, in high school, and so the, 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 you drop these so-called innocent kids on an island and they immediately form gangs and start hurting each other. And, and if, kids, if we were innocent people, that wouldn't happen, right? So um, the, uh, it proves that we're sinners. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up here in the next minute. Romans 3.10, as it is written... There is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 5.12 Therefore, just as through one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, through one man, there is a remedy. Uh, Romans 6.23 For the wages of sin are death. You sin, you die. Oh, but it looks like fun. You're going to die. Everybody else is doing it. You're going to die. <laughs> the wages of sin are death. Romans 5.8, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet or still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. I was thumbing my nose at God, I was thinking I was the man, and the Lord died for me. Even though I hated him at times. Uh, Romans 10, 9 through 10, that if you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that he raised Jesus from the dead you will be saved any other doctrine that tells you you need something else other plus that is not a biblical doctrine right. it's a doctrine that somebody's trying to give you so they can enslave you to their system now they may, may, be, they may even be doing it in well-meaning ways know your Bible Rev Romans 10:13. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It doesn't say whoever calls on the name of the Lord and donates to my church. It doesn't say whoever calls on the name of the Lord and does something else. Uh, Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing. And what must be heard? The word of God. That's why we try to emphasize the public preaching of Scripture. Because there's only one way to develop faith in the real God. Faith in the way that God has revealed himself, it's through his word. God never leads us contrary to, um, what, to uh, what his Bible says. I want to thank you for your time.